In the name of the law. We bring you another of the thrilling stories in this exciting series, taken from actual police case files. Our story begins outside a Detroit factory. Thanks for the lift, Joe. That was a big help. Oh, don't mention it, Charlie. Hey, how about me waiting for you? Well, I just want to leave these lamb chops for my sister. I'll be back right away. Oh, say, wait a minute. Uh, say, Charlie, I haven't seen Francis for a long time. Mind if I say hello? Oh, come on along. She'll be glad to see you. All right. Here. Let's just go around the back way here. How's she been? Oh, fine. Had her 55th birthday last Wednesday. Never looked better or felt younger. Oh, you bomb holes are lucky to have a sister like Francis look after you. <laughs> Don't we know it? Especially John and my nephew George. She's still keeping house here for them just as she did for Augustine and me. Father Augustine. Mm-hmm. Francis certainly had a dream come true when her brother became a priest. Yeah, it's her greatest pride. Tops her other pride is keeping a clean house and setting a good table. <laughs> we'll kid her a little bit. Uh, let's tell her we dropped in to eat these lamb chops. In a hurry, oh, too. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, here we are. Francis. Francis. Here's your Wednesday special. I like my lamb chops well done, Miss Palmholt. Francis. Francis. Honey, she doesn't seem to be around. Well, she must be here. She was expecting me. No sign of lunch getting ready in the kitchen here. No. Hey, think she could have taken sick? Uh, I don't think so. George is here. She'd have called him. Maybe she didn't want to disturb him. Isn't he still working on that night shift? Yeah, at the River Rouge packing plant. He sleeps in that room right down the hallway. Oh, must be a heavy sleeper, or else all the noise we made would have woke him up. Hmm. Say, maybe Francis is asleep. Well, Francis is asleep in the daytime? Say, she works from morning till night. Well, let me look in her bedroom, though, just to make sure. Francis? Francis? Are you sleeping? Francis? Francis. Oh, Francis. Francis. She's praying. She's praying? What? But she's dead. Murdered. And kneeling there beside her bed with a rosary in her hand. Merciful heaven. Oh, my, my poor sister. Don't touch that. Hmm, what's the matter, Inspector? A doorknob. There's blood stains on it. Oh, yeah. See it plainly now. Whose room is this? I think it's John Baumholt's room. You know, they're brother, eh? That's so many of these relatives. Yes. Right? They may all be innocent, but it sure looks like an inside job to me. How do you figure that, Inspector? You'll see for yourself. Now, look, Reed. We want photographs and fingerprints taken on this doorknob. Yes, Inspector. You got all those relatives outside? Yes, sir. Father Baumholt telephoned. He would be here any minute, too. It must have been a shock to him. Yes, her favorite brother, I understand. Let's have another look at Miss Baumholt's room. I guess the coroner's about finished. What's the verdict, Jim? Inspector, Miss Baumholt was killed sometime between 6 and 7 o'clock this morning. She died from these blows on the head. She couldn't have been killed kneeling there by the side of her bed, could she? Well, that's the question, Inspector. There are no signs of a struggle in this room. If there was a struggle here, that nephew George should have heard her. Hey, how do you figure that rosary, Inspector? Heaven help her. She died in prayer. How did she have strength to get her rosary? What do you mean by that? It's this way, Jim. She could have been placed in that kneeling position, that rosary put in her hand. Oh, I wonder if someone sent her to eternity and then tried to help her with prayer. Hey, what's this on the floor? I was just noticing that myself. Is it gravel? No, something else. Here. There's a few specks of it on the palm of my hand. Looks like coal dust to me. Hmm. Coal dust on an otherwise spotless floor. You're right, Jim. Doesn't make sense. From all I hear, this pool room was a spotless housekeeper and wouldn't go around tracking the place up with coal dust. Reed. Yes, Inspector. Get those rel- relatives together outside in the kitchen. I'll be out there in a minute. Yes, sir. Jim, as coroner, you've handled a lot of crimes with me. 
Now, just let the... Now, George, I know how you feel. <laughs> she was the best friend I had in the world. And I slept right through everything. Oh, all right, now. I don't think it's so hard, George. It, it wasn't your fault. I suspect that he was awfully fond of his aunt. Sure. Uh, Mr. Baumholt. Mr. Charles Baumholt. You'll have to straighten me out on this family relationship again. Well, uh, certainly, Inspector. Miss Baumholt kept house for your brother John here and your nephew George. Is that right? Yes, Inspector. We got my brother here from work as soon as we could. John, what time did you leave the house this morning? Right after breakfast, around a quarter of six. As early as that? I'm due at the office at six o'clock. And your sister cooked breakfast for you, is that right, John? Yeah. Was anyone at your office when you got there? No. I work in the accounting department and open it up at six. First clerk comes in at seven. Do you punch a time clock? No. Is there any way of proving you were at your office at six o'clock? You doubt my word. No, never mind, John. Ah, uh, what right has he got to be asking me questions like that? John? There were bloodstains on the knob of your bedroom door. What? Bloodstains on my door? Yes, just as plain as the doorknob. <laughs> Poor Andy. Oh, now, now, look, Inspector. None of us killed that good woman in there. Can your brother John prove he was at his office between 6 and 7 o'clock this morning? That's all I want to know. Well, there, there must be some way. You can prove it, can't you, John? I'm all alone there between 6 and 7. Let them take my fingerprints. Compare them with those on the doorknob. They won't be mine. All right, John, all right. You'll have a chance to prove everything. Why don't you go out and look for the murderer? Maybe it was a tramp who came along. My sister was always giving poor bums a meal. Yeah, she was a good woman. Always helping everybody. Dobbs, did you see your Uncle John leave here this morning? Yes, I, I saw him leave right after breakfast. George, you work on the night shift, I understand. Yes, Inspector. What time do you go to bed? Right after breakfast. I, I went to sleep right after Uncle John left this morning for work. Was your aunt expecting anybody this morning? Mm, not that I know of. How about you, John, and you, Charlie? Do you know of anyone who might have called on your sister? No, John, did your sister have any money in this house? Why ask me? Never mind why. I'm asking you. Yes, yeah, she had a little money. Inspector Smith. Uh, yes, Reed. Inspector, there's an old woman at the front door. She wants to come in. Who is she? She says she bakes bread for the bombos and wants to leave some now. Oh, uh, oh yes, that's Mrs. Becker. She's a poor old lady, Inspector, and my sister bought bread from her to help her out. What'll I tell her, Inspector? Uh, tell her to come back again. Mm, yes, sir. We were talking about money, John. You say Miss Baumholt kept some here in the house? Yeah, she had about $50. Where'd she keep it? In the sugar bowl in the kitchen cabinet there. Will you show it to me? Sure. Right over here. Up there on the top shelf. Here it is. Wait a minute. I'll get it down. Let me handle it with this handkerchief. There might be some valuable fingerprints on this sugar bowl. Just lift the lid off now. Hmm. No money in here. Why, she had $50 there in bill. She's been saving it up for a long time. Murdered for $50. How do you know? What? You heard me. How do you know? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I don't hear so well. Well, the money's gone, isn't it? Whoever took this money knew exactly where to go for it. Whoever killed that good woman in there knew her. Oh, poor Aunt Frances. <laughs> she was the best friend I had in the world. <laughs> oh, don't go on like that, George. <laughs> ah, cut it out, will you? <laughs> Inspector Smith, I just had a phone call. Could I... Uh... Oh, yes, sir. What is it, Reed? Inspector, we just got a tip outside on this nephew, George. What is it? George wanted money to open up a butcher shop. I see. Stick around, Reed. Yes, Inspector. Charlie, John, do you mind stepping out into the next room? I want to talk with George here. Oh, I... Of Pay attention now, George. <laughs> yes, sir. How much money do you make a week? Fifteen dollars. Did you pay your aunt anything for board? Yes, sir. Ten dollars a week. You knew where your aunt kept her money, didn't you? What did you say? Can't you hear very well? Oh, no, sir, I don't. I guess that's why I didn't hear Aunt Francis this morning. What was it you asked me? You did know, didn't you, where your aunt kept her money? Yes, but you don't think Never that... mind what I think. You don't like that night shift at the packing plant, do you? No, it's... Long hours and awful hard work. So you wanted to open a butcher shop, didn't you, George? Why? You had what? the store all picked out, didn't you? I was just looking at places. Just dreaming about it, was that right, George? Yeah. How, how was I going to get money enough to open a butcher shop? That well, was... maybe the packing plant would have given you a little credit. And with your aunt's name to back you up and a little of her cash? Oh, you, 
You don't think I killed my aunt for a miserable $50. I've seen people murdered for less than that. But how could I have killed her? I was asleep. You slept all morning. Right through a murder. I tell you, I'm a heavy sleeper. I, I don't hear very well. I didn't hear a thing. Then we won't find your fingerprints on this sugar bowl, will we? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, sure. Of course you'll find my fingerprints. My Uncle John's, my Uncle Charlie's. We handle that sugar bowl every Sunday, whenever we have company. All right, George, all right. <laughs> You're a heavy sleeper. And I don't hear very well. Sure. That's all, George. You can go out in the next room now. <laughs> and Francis has raised me ever since I was ten. He took me when my father and mother died. George. Yes? You don't hear very well, eh? <laughs> tragedy, Father Baumholt. All the women in the neighborhood are here weeping for your sister. Yes, Inspector Smith. My sister was a woman with true charity in her heart. She lived a Christian life, but I'm sure she died a Christian death, even though it was a violent one. Father Baumholt, uh, I'm in a rather difficult position. I saw you pray beside Miss Francis just now, and I... I'm a man of a cloth, and you hesitate to say things you might say to someone else. Is that it, Inspector? Yes, Father. Well, do not let it concern you. Do your duty. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. You mean I... The law must take its course. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Very well, Father. You've talked with your brother John and your nephew George? Yes. Have they told you that we consider both of them first-class suspects? Yes, they have. Well, Father, this is pretty hard to say, but, well, circumstantial evidence against them is pretty heavy. I don't wish to divert your investigation in any direction, but I'm rather sure of one thing. What's that, Father Bumholt? Such a deed, if it were possible, would have caused instant regret and almost immediate confession from either John or George. Uh, Father, you certainly have me in a tough spot. Do your duty, my son. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I ask no vengeance for my sister. Only the law under which we live. Well, I'm having those bloodstains on the doorknob checked against everybody's fingerprints. And the fingerprints on the teacup? Yes. And the coal dust? Father, we're checking on that right now. Must have been tracked in from the coal shed in the yard. We've talked to all the neighbors. They heard nothing. You can't go in there, I tell you. But I've got to see Father Bumholt. I've just got to see him. I just want to say a word to him. Why, certainly. Come right in. Oh, uh, may she inspect him? Oh, certainly, certainly. Oh, Father, you don't know how sorry I am about your sister. There now, Mrs. Beckham. It was God's will. Such a good woman. Such a kind neighbor. This is a woman who brings bread to the house. Mrs. Becker, the one I told you about, Inspector. Oh, yes, yes. Perhaps you could help us, Mrs. Becker. I would be glad to. Indeed, I would. Yes, sit down, please. Thank you. Oh, it's good to sit down. I'm not as young at 60 as I was at 20. But you're hale and hearty, Mrs. Becker. Good and strong. Inspector Smith, Mrs. Becker has been baking bread for my sister for a great many years. Oh, yes. Many the loaf I've baked for her. <laughs> but no more now. Yeah, they are my child. Mrs. Becker, just how often did you bring bread here? Every Wednesday and Saturday. When you were here today? Yes, I came a while ago, but the police wouldn't let me in. That's right, Inspector. Mrs. Becker... You knew all of Mrs. Baumholt's family, didn't you? Yes. Did you ever hear any quarrels among them? Speak, my child. There was never a harsh word spoken in this house. Miss Francis was a soul of kindness, and everyone around here felt her good influence. Thank you, Mrs. Becker. I'm only speaking the truth. Everyone in this neighborhood will tell you the same thing. Who do you think killed her? I don't know. It might have been a tramp. It seemed like every hobo on the road knew that Miss Francis' house was the one that wouldn't turn them away for a bite to eat. Have you ever seen any of these tramps? Oh, yes, many times. Would you remember any of these tramps if you saw them again? Maybe I would. I would try. Reed, send out a flash to pick up all vagrants. Have them brought up to the headquarters and we'll have Mrs. Becker look them over. Let me out of this place. 
You don't remember nothing, I tell you. I assure this man, Mr. Becker. Oh, I've seen so many of these men you've arrested, but this one's been around to Miss Bombo's place. I'm sure of that. You don't deny that, do you, Morton? No, I've been around there, but I ain't got nothing to do with that. Uh, then day. why didn't you tell us where you were Wednesday morning, the morning of the murder? Honest, I can't remember. All I know is I was in a lot of saloons, bumming drinks. You haven't been bumming drinks, Morton. You've been paying for them. You spent money in bars all along Michigan Avenue. We've checked up on you, Morton. You were spending the money you took from that sugar bowl. No, no, I got that going at dice game. Trying to be leaving for the funeral, Inspector. All right, Reed. Take this man back and lock him up. Yes, sir. Come on, Morton. I didn't kill that woman. Sure, she gave me a hand up once in a while, but I wasn't there Wednesday. Are you ready, Mrs. Becker? Yes, Inspector. All right, we'll go right over to the church. Say it Sergeant. Yes, sir. Um, I've never been to a funeral mass before. Yes, it's beautiful and sad and uplifting all in one. I wonder how her brother will feel this morning. What do you mean? Saying his own sister's funeral mass. Uh, oh, are you sure you don't mind riding with a police escort like this? Oh, no. I was just thinking of poor Miss Francis. This is Saturday, the morning I always used to bring her bread. Morning, Mrs. Becker. In the morning, Wednesdays and Saturdays. Oh, that is, I mean in the afternoon. Well, aren't you sure? I get my wits of wool gathering. I always brought the bread in the afternoon. You remember, I came to the house last Wednesday in the afternoon. Oh, yes, yes, I remember. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Becker, do you mind if I sit with you during the Mass? No, indeed. I, I wish you would. I've never been to a funeral Mass. Tearing your handkerchief. I'm just nervous, that's all. I think of poor Francis lying there in front of the altar in that casket. This is all so new to me, the candles and the music. It does things to you. Yes. It's the house of God. going to do now? He's going to preach the funeral sermon. I wish I didn't have to sit here and listen to that. I'd like to leave. If you left the church now, Mrs. Becker, people would suspect you of the murder. I didn't do it. How could I do such a thing? Quiet. Father Barnold is going to speak. My dear brethren, I take this for my text this morning. Though I speak to the tongues of men and angels and have not charity... I am a sounding brass, all round of tinkling symbol. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, amen. I perform this sad duty this morning, my dear brethren, not as a brother, but as one in the service of the Lord. And if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, 
and have not charity. I can't stand this much longer. You killed her, didn't you, Miss Becker? No, no. Listen to what he's saying. Charity was the keynote to the life of this dear departed one. Her life was lived for her family and her friends. As a young girl, it was her desire to enter a convent and become a nun. This pious wish was foregone when she, together with three brothers, became an orphan. Can't bear this. Thus, well, something makes you stay in this church and listen, Lord, doesn't it? But him Grant, you put her in that coffin. You killed her. He was always so good to me. And why did you kill her? I didn't. It is not for us Please. to judge, but to be judged. This servant of the Lord was prepared to go. As she lived, so she died. Embraced in the love of God. There was never anything but charity in the sweet, clean soul of my sister who lies before me in death. What simple goods of this world she had, she shared with others. Her reward, not in this life, but in the next, will be to hear those words of eternal comfort. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. This faithful servant of the law was taken from this world by a violent hand. No, no. It was your hand. You did it. I would be a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol if I did not ask for charity or compassion for the one guilty of this grievance. The laws of eternal justice reach beyond this little day of ours. I can't stand this. You'll have to take me out of this church. You killed Francis Pondo, didn't you? Admit it. Yes. Yes, I killed her. Take me out of here. All right. Come on. Let's go as quietly as we can. I should never have come to this funeral. I, I was all right till I came here. Take me out. Take me out. Take me out. And so, my dear brethren... If I could only take back what I did. It's too late now. Be guided by this blameless light. Learn the reward. Mass over, Inspector. Not yet, Sergeant. Here's the murder of Francis Baumholt. She had everything, I tell you. I had nothing. She was a poor woman. She had fifty dollars in a sugar bowl. And you killed her for that after all she did for you. Sure. She bought bread for me. She gave me money besides. And she gave me clothes, but it wasn't enough. I asked her for more. You planned everything for last Wednesday morning, didn't you? Yes. I had it all figured out. Last Wednesday morning, around six o'clock, I took bread to Miss Francis. I found her in the post Carolyn, I would be glad to help you, but I can't do any more now. That's right. Throw your charity in my face. Now, Carolyn, I know you've been working hard. Come in the house and I'll make you a cup of nice hot tea. I don't want tea. I want money. I, I'm tired of slaving all my life. Now, now, just wait till I fill up this cold stuff. You have $50 in the kitchen in a sugar bowl. Helen, you mustn't think so soft. You mustn't think of that money. It's all we have. But look, I will let you have a little of it. I don't want a little of it. I want all of it. And I'm going to get it now. Helen, stop. I hit her a lot of times when I carried her into the house. She wanted to pray, so I got her rosary for her and helped her to kneel by the side of the bed. I put blood stains on that doorknob. I took the money. Sure, I took it. I killed her for it. I'm an old woman, but I'm strong. I killed her. I killed her. Mrs. Carolyn Becker, the jury having found you guilty of murder in the first degree, it now becomes the duty of this court to pass sentence upon you. I hope that the prayers of your victim may follow you. I hereby sentence you to state prison for the rest of your natural life. Withers 
again when truth and justice triumph in the name of the law.